I'm not going to lie to you, and I'm not going to try to justify my heinous actions. I am a serial killer of the worst kind, a mass murderer. Over the last 24 years, I've been directly or indirectly responsible for over 200 murders. I don't kill for a good cause or for the purpose of having a bad time. Instead, I murder for money, power, and prestige. I'll let you decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. The majority of my victims are officially recorded as missing, presumed dead. Their bodies have never been found and will never be found. That's nearly 200 families who will never know what happened to their loved ones. I'm not proud of what I've done or of the carnage and misery I've caused. Some of the killings will haunt me until the day I die. These were the people who were mostly innocent, only guilty of minor infractions or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. They're the ones I'm most sorry for, because those people didn't deserve to die in such a horrible way. On the other end of the scale are the true evil shits, the psychopaths and sadists, members of rival gangs who inflicted their fair share of mayhem and suffering. Those jerks got what they deserved, and I took some satisfaction from their deaths. Even so, after all these years and murders, they tend to blend into one a montage of bloody carnage that has become a nightmare blur in my memory. I remember the details more than the names and faces. I see those trembling bodies, often blindfolded and with their hands bound behind their backs, standing or kneeling at the pit's edge. Many will beg or plead for their lives, but it will be in vain. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't let them go. We'll sometimes put them out of their misery before they die by cutting their throats or shooting a bullet through the back of their heads. However, more often than not, we will shove them down into the pit while they are still alive and breathing. Our benefactor prefers his victims in this manner. Because the pit isn't as deep as it appears from above, the victim usually survives their fall, even with both legs broken. My partner and I will stand above, looking down into the darkness, as the injured victim screams in pain and crawls through the dirt, bones, and shit that cover the bottom of the stinking pit. Then we'll hear an enormous roar reverberating throughout the connected tunnels, as well as the sound of something massive tearing its way through. I'll never get used to that awful roar, no matter how many times I hear it. It's hard for me to imagine the victim's terror as the beast charges towards him or her in the darkness. They'll have come expecting to die, but few could have predicted such a terrible end. The attack is usually over quickly a violent blur of viscera, with the victim never standing a chance. I'll feel some satisfaction as I walk away from the bloody scene knowing that the ritual has been completed. And our criminal fraternity will continue to grow in success until the next sacrifice is needed. You're probably confused and troubled at this point, so let me start from the beginning. I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak, having been born and raised in one of the city's poorest and most crime-ridden neighborhoods. My father was absent, and my mother was an addict. As a result, in the absence of adult supervision or positive role models, I was raised on the streets, learning to live by my wits and fists. By my early teens, I'd earned a reputation in the area as a tough kid, but I also had street smarts and was always able to make a quick buck. Before moving on to armed robbery, I worked as a cat burglar, breaking into homes and such. The cops never captured me but my criminal activities drew the attention of the local Mafia family. I made the potentially deadly mistake of robbing a liquor store that was providing mob protection. The local wise guys weren't pleased with me, but my case was brought to the attention of Cale Alvarez, a rising star in the family. Cale was only in his early 20s at the time, but he was already well known in the city's criminal underworld. He carried out his first hit when he was in his teens and was regarded as one of the city's most ruthless and efficient assassins. Kale's boss was Angel, 
a rising gangster who'd risen through the ranks through a combination of skill, ruthlessness, and sheer force of will. With Kale as his right-hand man, Angel would eventually eliminate all of his gangland rivals and avoid legal scrutiny to become the city's most powerful gangster, ruling a vast criminal empire encompassing drugs, prostitution, and extortion. Illegal gambling, loan sharking, protection rackets, hit for hire, and just about everything in between are all possibilities. But that was all in the future. Other than their violent reputations, I knew little about Angel and Kale at the time. I was a tough kid, but when I was called up in front of Kale Alvarez for my mistakes, I almost pooped my pants. I'll never forget the night I was driven out to an abandoned parking lot near the docks and placed in front of Kale. He was a handsome and charismatic man, all dressed up in an Armani suit, with his dark hair slicked back and his short beard perfectly groomed. I recognized his dark eyes looking down at me, intelligent but also predatory. Kale was charming, but there was always a sinister undercurrent to his words giving the impression that he'd slit your throat without hesitation. That night, I was terrified because I thought he was going to kill me right then and there. He, of course, did not. Despite my bad behavior, Kale was impressed by my criminal abilities and the stories he'd heard about me around town. As a result, he gave me two options that evening, accept my punishment for the robbery, a savage beating with baseball bats, breaking my arms and legs in the process, or join the family business and become Kale's newest apprentice. Needless to say, I made an easy decision. I accompanied Kale on my first kidnapping slash murder only two months later. For me, this was a watershed moment, a true crossing the Rubicon situation. That night, I sold my soul and I mean that literally rather than metaphorically. On the night of the kidnapping, I was drinking at Lava. It's a bar on the city's south side run by an ex-gangster who didn't bother his customers with too many questions. i just finished my second whiskey when Kale walked in, his eyes quickly scanning the bar's interior for me. The look on his face told me he was serious, and this was no social call. As I welcomed him, I felt a lump in my throat. What's up, boss? He solemnly nodded his head, his intense eyes narrowing as he replied. Finish your drink. Tonight is our working night. I could tell from his body language and the tone of his voice that tonight's job would be more than just a typical hijacking or punishment beating. Kale wanted me to make my bones, to finish my first kill. I realized right then and there. I'd done a lot of bad stuff up to that point in my life, but I hadn't killed anyone. I wasn't overjoyed at the prospect of murdering someone. I've never been one of those psychopaths who enjoys it. Even so, I was aware that I needed to make my bones in order to grow in the family, and I was prepared to do so. But I had no idea what was in store for me. We drove to the location on the outskirts of town in a stolen car, with Kale driving and me riding shotgun. I was carrying a snub-nosed 38 revolver, not much use in a long gunfight, but useful for close-range executions. During the 20-minute journey, not a single word was spoken. Kale remained completely silent and focused on the road, and I knew better than to inquire. When the time was right, Kale would tell me what I needed to do. We came to a halt at an abandoned warehouse in a desolate industrial estate just outside of town. It was a place I'd never been before, but it evoked images of gangland executions and buried bodies. Kale drove up onto a road of wasteland, parking in the mud and waiting, the engine still running and the car's headlights illuminating the low light scene. We sat there in tense silence until I couldn't take the tension any longer. What on earth is this place, Kale? I asked, a little nervously. The land and warehouse are owned by Angel. It's his area. 
Kale responded dismissively. I nodded, knowing he hadn't actually answered my question. I made the decision to press for more information. Boss, why are we waiting here? I thought we had a mission. This is fucking the job. Now, shut your damn mouth and stay calm, Kale yelled back angrily. You'll find out the truth eventually. I wasn't sure what to make of his cryptic words, but I knew better than to ask any more. In any case, I didn't have to wait long for my answers. A few minutes later, another vehicle showed up, slowly plowing through the muddy wasteland and pulling up to a parking spot about 20 yards from ours. Kale watched with caution as the doors of the dark sedan swung open and two tall and bulky men stepped out dressed in cheap suits and armed with 9mm pistols tucked into their waistbands. Kale clearly recognized the men as he opened the car door and stepped out, advancing across the dead ground to greet the newcomers. One of the gangsters, a dark-skinned, balding man, took a step forward and spoke. Excuse us for being late, boss. Fucking freeway traffic. Did you got the package? Kale suddenly interjected. He's in the trunk, boss, the gangster confirmed. It didn't cause us too much trouble. Get him the fuck out. Kale gave the order. I turned around to see two gangsters manhandling their victim, dragging him out of the trunk and frog marching him across the waste ground. The prisoner was dressed in a soiled tracksuit, his hands tied behind his back and a black bag draped over his head, obscuring his vision. He was a normal-sized man, but he was dwarfed by the pair of beast enforcers who held him. I noticed how he barely resisted his captors, his demeanor completely defeated and submissive. Kale reached the hooded man, standing only inches away from his face as he examined the victim with a sharp eye. Get that head off his head. Kale gave the order. It makes no difference if he sees our faces now. One of the thugs followed, removing the victim's hood. The face beneath was pathetic, his nose was broken and his face was covered in dried blood. His eyes were red and tired. Surprisingly, he didn't appear scared or worried. Instead, the victim appeared damaged and defeated. He looked up at my companion as he adjusted his eyes to the glare of the headlights. They turned out to know each other, much to my surprise. Is that you, Alvarez? He muttered through trembling lips. That's me, buddy. We're sorry we have to meet in this way. Kale replied calmly. The condemned man surprised me yet again by dismissively shrugging his shoulders. I messed up. He admitted simply. You did, indeed. Kale confirmed it. Is there any hope for me? Is there any chance of a pass? Kale shook his head in disbelief. Can't do it, old pal. What happens when you steal from Angel? There is no turning back. What about my body? The man asked. Can you get it back to my family so they can properly bury me? I can't do it either, man. It's out of my hands, Kale replied, his voice now colored with guilt. You are aware of this, but we'll inform your people. Inform them that you will not be returning home. The condemned man's face broken and tears welled up in his eyes as I watched. Fuck it, he exclaimed after taking a deep breath. Let's get this done. Kale grabbed the bound man, dismissing the two thugs in the process. We stood there watching as they drove away, and then Kale directed us to the waiting warehouse, where we led our victim on a sad death march. At this point, it's safe to say I was quite disturbed. I became hardened to death and violence over the years, but this was my first killing, and Kale's coldness toward our soon-to-be victim surprised me and the man's meek acceptance of his fate almost made things worse. 
but I was aware that Kale was keeping a close eye on me and assessing my performance. My entire future in the criminal underworld was riding on how I acted in the next few minutes, and I was determined not to screw it up. Kale forced me to hold the condemned man while we unlocked the door and entered the warehouse. The inside of the building was nearly empty, except for a few portable lamps powered by a generator. A gaping, open hole in the ground about 20 by 10 meters across sat in the middle of the concrete floor. I was perplexed and a little concerned. I initially assumed the pit was a mass grave. That was bad enough, but the truth was far worse. We dragged our man forward, all the way to the pit's edge. I remember his entire body shaking uncontrollably and him being unable to stand without assistance. The stench near the pit was horrifying, a foul mixture of rotting flesh and what smelled like animal waste. Just like what you'd find in a zoo. I was upset but terrifyingly curious, staring over the side but seeing nothing but darkness. Be careful not to get too close. Kale alerted. Our victim was down on his knees by the pit's edge by this moment, muttering a quiet prayer through trembling lips. I took out my piece and was going to fire it when something stopped me. Suddenly, I heard a faint sound coming from the dark bottom of the pit, which quickly became louder. When I first heard the animalistic growl, it was quickly followed by an almighty roar that filled the space. A second later, what sounded like a rhino-sized beast stormed into the pit, causing the ground to shake due to its immense size and strength. I couldn't get a good look at the monster because I couldn't see anything but a dark shape circling the bottom of the pit. I turned to face the trembling victim, who was whimpering in terror as a stream of urine poured down his trouser leg. What the hell is going on down there? I screamed to be heard over the creature's growls. Shoot him and kick his body down there. Kale gave a booming order. I shook my head, confused. I'm not sure. I answered back. Shoot him in the head. Kale yelled. I pulled my revolver and pushed the barrel against the back of his head. I paused before firing because I didn't want to pull the trigger, but I realized that killing him would be a mercy in compared to what lay below. I fired with my eyes closed, feeling the kickback as my victim's head exploded. His lifeless body slid forward, over the edge. I heard the poor dude's dead body hit the bottom with a dull loud sound, and then the beast snatched him up in his mighty jaws, biting down on flesh and bone and producing a sickening crack. I spotted a glimpse of the monster as it appeared from the shadows, with its shark-like eyes and massive mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth. The sight of the beast sent shivers up my spine, a primitive terror unlike anything I'd ever felt before. The beast then dragged the corpse back into the shadows and began to devour his flesh in a sickening display. I walked away from the pit, annoyed, feeling as if I was about to throw up. Kale gave me a moment to collect my thoughts before approaching, slapping me on the back, and speaking. You did well, kid. The very first time is always the most difficult. Let's get out of here as soon as possible. I don't remember much about our road going back to town. I think I was still in shock, my brain still processing the horror of what I just witnessed. I was able to talk after a little period, asking Kale the most important of questions. What on earth happened back there? I insisted. I'll tell you everything I know, but we're going to need a drink. Kale responded. We were sitting in an isolated stall in an empty bar 15 minutes later, separate from people. I ordered a double whiskey and drank it in one. What in the world was that? I questioned, even I didn't want to hear an answer. Kale took a sip from his own drink before responding. I'm not sure exactly. There is no name for it. I only know where it comes from. 
A tunnel deep within the earth, a passageway to. He took a brief pause to consider his next words. You believe there is an afterlife, kid? What about heaven and hell? The question confused me, so I shrugged. I suppose so. I've never really thought about it. I responded. Kale kept going by shaking his head. How about a win-win fair deal, says the narrator. Have you heard of that? I shook my head side to side. It's a fairy tale about a man who struck a bargain with the devil, Kale explained. I laughed dismissively and scoffed. I don't believe in all that supernatural stuff, I said. Well, Angel does, and he's not on the side of the angels. How can you doubt what you witnessed tonight? I was completely lost for words. I don't have all the informations. But Angel made a deal with the person downstairs a few years ago, Kale continued. The deal is easy. Angel makes regular sacrifices to the beast below in exchange for everything he wants and needs in life, money and power, no trouble with the law, and all his competitors dead or in jails. As long as he gives the bodies, the good times will keep going. I shook my head from side to side, wanting to believe it was all a sick joke or some kind of creation. But there was no way to describe what I'd witnessed down there. As I attempted to understand of what I'd been told, my brain was racing at a thousand mile per hour. I'm not familiar with Kale. I've done some bad shit in my time. It's one thing to rob and shoot people, but what about trying to deal with the devil and human sacrifices? That's a whole completely different level. Kale lifted his head in agreement. I know, man. I felt the same way the first time I saw that beast and found out the truth. But consider it this way. We benefit as Angel becomes more powerful. In a few years, our crew will be in charge of this town. And if the devil breaks the agreement, Angel will be the one who will pay the cost. It's a win-win situation. So, what do you think, kid? You want to make it in the big leagues? I know I should have just left right then and there, but what could I say? I'm not a good person, and the hopes of power and fortune were attractive. So I said yeah sure, and my life was forever changed. Kale was correct, to a point. It did get easier and easier, but we had to make a lot of hard choices in the start. It was around this time that Angel went to battle with the city's largest mafia family and the streets turned blood red. Our boss was eventually successful, thanks to the deal he'd made with the man downstairs, but it was a long and deadly gangland fight that kept our death squad very busy. I'm not sure how many men we killed during that gang fight, the faces and names disappear over time. We weren't able to give the beast all of our victims. Most of them were killed in the streets. But, Whenever possible, we kidnapped our enemies and moved them to the warehouse. This was not always a simple task. Some of the men we captured were tough bastards who fought hard. But, and without exception, when we got them to the pit and they heard the beast's scary loud sound, they would throw up. These men were dirty fucks, gangsters, drug smugglers, abusers, and hired killers. They were the worst among the worst, and I didn't mind serving them up as human sacrifices. If the tables were turned, these morons would gladly torture and murder us. I'd had mercy on my first victim, shooting him dead and then letting his body fall into the pit. But the beast preferred his meals to be alive, so we pushed the majority of our victims down as they were still alive hearing the fracture of bones as they hit the bottom and relishing their terrified cries as the beast destroyed them. After a while, I started to worry that I was loving my job too much, so I had to remind myself how terrifying this was. But those were prosperous years for our squad. 
Angel annihilated all of his adversaries and took total power of all criminal groups across the city. We were the most feared and respected men in the town as the money is flowing in. Angel soon became unstoppable, with city leaders, top law enforcement officers, and jury members all in his wallet. Even the most honest officers and attorneys weren't able to create a case, and our boss was never arrested. Yes, those were happy times, and the ritual sacrifices were clearly effective. However, it did not last. The problem was that we had too much achievement. Angel no longer had any rivals to eliminate after the gang war ended. However, the devil and his beast were tough, and they continued to demand new sacrifices. We soon began killing men and women for the most minor of incidents or insults. But the scumbags were so scared of Angel and us that they wouldn't dare to step out of line, so we had to switch tactics yet again. That's when we began selecting victims at random. They were people we knew no one would miss, mainly the homeless and drug addicts. We discovered that doping our victims before throwing them into the pit was easier. As we dragged them to their deaths, I made them more helpless by throwing those poor bastards over the edge and stepping away as the beast tore them to pieces. Kale and I didn't talk much on those nights, but we were both unhappy. My involvement in these mass killings, an apparently never-ending roller of death and misery, disgusted me. I tried it all to make my pain disappear, drinking, drugs, sex, but nothing worked. I couldn't get away from the deep shame I brought with me. Kale was promoted to Angel's number two position around six months ago. I wasn't sure how I thought about the change. Kale and I had been colleagues for a long time, and we had a dark secret in common. But a part of me was relieved to see him go. Even though I knew I'd made my own free choices, I'd begun to hate the man who'd inspired me down this deadly path. However, the asshole they sent to replace Kale turned out to be a real jerk. Danny is his name, and he born and raised in my neighborhood, being exposed to the criminal world at a young age. Danny was the type of kid who tortured small animals for fun before moving to torturing humans. He took a twisted, sadistic joy in killing, which Kale and I had never understood. We saw the murders as a horrific but essential act, and we tried to be as competent as possible, but Danny loved killing and was almost thrilled every time we carried out a sacrifice. He'd make fun of our victims, laughing in their faces as they asked for mercy, or giving them unrealistic expectations before striking them down. Danny, too, was obsessed with the horrible beast, almost worshipping it. He went on and on about every horrific killing, when all I wanted to do was forget. Working with a serial killer like Danny exacerbated an already horrific situation. I knew I couldn't keep this up for much longer. Everyone has a breakthrough, and I hit mine about a week ago. The night of what would be my final murder sacrifice began likewise to my first, with me having a drink in a dive bar and waiting for a phone call. Danny called just after midnight to say Angel wanted us to work tonight. I took a deep breath as I drank my whiskey and walked out onto the airstreet where Danny was waiting in a dark sedan. I climbed into the passenger side, recognizing Danny's evil smile and strange sparkle in his eye. His attitude quickly put me on alert. What happened to the job? I questioned, my voice tired. There's an asshole in the trunk. Danny replied, cruel laughing. He's all set for his one-way journey through hell. Throughout our road out of town, I grimaced and asked no more questions. I presumed the man lying in the trunk was another unnamed victim swiped from the streets. On that awful night, I had no idea what was in store for me. We arrived at the warehouse shortly before 1 a.m., I stepped out of the car, shaking from the cold, staring up at the stars as Danny opened the trunk to reveal the hooded victim inside. 
The man inside was taped up, his hands tied in front of him. He was dressed in what seemed to be an expensive suit, but it was ripped, dirted, and covered in dried blood. At first glance, he appeared to be a classic kidnap victim, but something didn't seem quite right. Get up, you asshole. Danny placed her order. The victim agreed, shakingly dragging himself out of the trunk and standing on his own two feet. I couldn't figure it out. Danny, what's going on here? Why isn't he drugged? I asked in my partner's ear. We used to dope our prisoners in order to make them submissive and less likely to resist. Danny answered loudly, making certain that our victim heard. That would be too simple, man. Angel wishes for this Cretan to suffer. He'll realize it when the beast devours him. Isn't that true, buddy? He hit the hooded man in the back of his head, causing him to yelp in pain and surprise. This did not sit well with me. Danny was playing games, and I wasn't going to let it go. I reached out and pulled the hood off our victim's head in an instant. Then I screamed in horror as I saw my old boss and brother in arms, Kale Alvarez's, bloodied and bruised face. I stood there in wonder, staring at my friend, seeing such an expression of total defeat and resignation that I'd seen in many other condemned men over the years. He lowered his eyes, as if unable to meet mine. What the fuck, man, Kale? I said. It's okay, old buddy, it's my time to go, this isn't your fault, man. As Danny pushed Kale forward, Towards the warehouse and his terrible fate, I shook my head in disbelief. In a frenzy of panic, I chased after them, shouting questions. Kale, I'm not getting it. How did this happen? I screwed up, man, he admitted sincerely, took a shot at the king and missed. I'm now paying the price. I just couldn't get it. But even so, why? Why the hell would you do that? I exclaimed. Kale suddenly came to a halt, fighting Danny's grip to turn and face me, his eyes filled with a flame intensity. Because that son of a bitch needs to be stopped. Angel and his horrible deal. What we did. It's horrific. I should have stopped years ago, but I was helpless. Don't make the same fault. That evil fucker must be removed. Danny put an end to Kale's rage by beating him around the head and pushing him to continue his death march. Shut the fuck up, coward, screamed the murderer. I should have attempted to stop it, but I guess I was still in shock and couldn't believe what was happening in front of my eyes. Danny, on the other hand, knew exactly what he was doing as he dragged the helpless Kale inside the warehouse and Frog marched him to the waiting pit. I trailed behind in a confused state, my brain racing as I badly tried to make sense of this odd twist and plan my next move. Danny and Kale walked ahead of me as we entered the terrible warehouse. I saw the pit and heard the beast's faint roar as it tore across the tunnel, thirstily expecting its next meal. I lost control, grabbing Danny's shoulder and pulling him around while my other hand rested on the buttstock of my pistol. Wait, what are you doing? Danny cussed loudly, his dark eyes filled with rage. We're not going to do this. With determination, I shouted back. I was sure we were going to fight, but Kale stepped in. It's alright, old buddy, he said politely making direct eye contact with me. It's my turn. This is going to happen. But Kale... I whimpered, losing hope in my cause. But nothing. It's the end for me. It makes no sense for you to die as well. Pay attention to your friend here. Danny replied, a perverted look on his face. As Kale marched towards his terrible fate, I was paralyzed, unable to act or respond. 
I couldn't figure it out. Kale knew what was going on down there better than anyone else, so how could he accept such a horrible death so calmly? Kale kneeled by the pit's edge, mimicking the stance of our first victim all those years before. In the meantime, the beast charged into the pit, its dark shadow crawling in joy and produces a low animalistic roar. I had never seen anybody so excited about a sacrifice in a long time. It looked as if it identified its upcoming prey. I knew what the monster did to living bodies, and I was determined that Carl would not suffer the same fate. After all, he had once been a friend of mine. At the very least, I'll give you a peaceful death. I said grimly, drawing my pistol and holding it to his head. I wasn't sure how my old friend would react, so I was taken aback when he turned to face me, his eyes filled with a flaming strength. Listen, this evil must be eliminated. You must complete what I began. Kale didn't have time to finish his intense last words because Danny kicked him hard in the back, pushing his body over the edge. Goodbye, asshole. Send us a Hell's Postal address. Danny laughed out loud. No. I screamed as I leaned forward, but it was too late. I watched in terror as my friend fell into the darkness, his body landing with a heavy thump at the bottom. Kale was awake when he fell to the ground. He attempted to climb to escape, but the beast was on him in a second, smashing his helpless body beneath its massive hooves, snapping bones like branches. Kale screamed in pain as the beast made another pass, this time catching its prey in its massive jaws and tossing him across the pit like a rag doll. I lost it at that moment, pointing my gun and firing down into the hole, something I'd never done before. You nasty fucker, die! Between shots, I yelled. My pistol was empty in a matter of seconds. Even though it was dark and my aim was wrong, I must have struck the beast at least three or four times. The beast didn't even pause, the bullets bouncing off his hide like it was made of steel. I could only watch in horror as it proceeded to play with Kale's defenseless body, obviously taking delight in his pain. The terrifying adventure ended when the creature bit through Carl's midsection virtually tearing him in half before dragging his torn remnants into the shadows and devouring his flesh. I stood at the open pit's edge, perspiring profusely and crying, trying to come to grips with Kale's awful death. My sixth sense was heightened when I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand on edge. When I turned back, I saw Danny coming up behind me, his hand going for his pistol and his eyes full with homicidal intent. He would have shoved me down into the hole a split second later, but Danny was taken off guard, like a deer in headlights. I took a step back and clenched my hands, bracing myself for a struggle for my life. Danny wasn't used to battling individuals who fought back. As a result, he hesitated. We exchanged tense looks for a minute before I finally broke the quiet. Are we done here? I inquired coldly. Yeah. Danny responded after a little delay. We're finished. Let's get the hell out of here. And we exited the warehouse, trying to avoid the beasts nibbling on Kale's bones. I made it through the night by the skin of my teeth, but I know my days are numbered. With Kale gone, my allegiance is clearly called into question. Angel knows I'm not his guy anymore, but he has no idea I'm coming for him. Kale's dying words have stayed with me. He was correct, this evil had to be stopped. I plan to go after Angel tonight, armed to the teeth. I'm going to murder him or die trying. It's the only way to put an end to this living nightmare. I'm aware that this one act will not make up for all the horrible crap I've done. It's too late for repentance, and I expect to be burned for my crimes. But damn it! 
I'm going to relish watching that bastard's expression immediately before I shoot a bullet into his fucking head. And it'll be even wonderful when that filthy beast is sent to hell. It's time to get back to work.